Okay, so welcome everyone to tonight's panel, which is hosted by Platypus, as Indoni mentioned. This talk's called Which Way Forward for Sexual Liberation? To start off, I'm just going to talk a little about what Platypus is and what it does. I'm a member, as you can see from my badge here. <laughs> Platypus is an international organization that hosts reading groups, public forums, research and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old, new, and post-political left for the possibility of emancipatory politics today. We have chapters in Halifax, Toronto, New York City, Chicago, Boston, the UK, Germany, Greece, a couple other places too. After the conclusion of tonight's events, I'd just like to remind everyone that we're going to go out to uh, the grad house for a drink or two. And uh, if you're interested in continuing these conversations and meeting new people, we'll be there, as will hopefully some of our panelists. So tonight's panelists were asked to consider how, rooted in earlier radical traditions, the 1960s saw movements emerge that sought to fundamentally and unapologetically redefine the relationship of sex, politics, and freedom. While much has changed within the half century throughout the world, human sexual and erotic lives still face restriction, misunderstanding, and all too often violence. So our panelists were presented with the following prompts when we asked them to draft their presentations. The first is that the question of how did LGBTQ rights movement become such? What has this relation to the left been, and how has the contemporary political focus on same-sex marriage affected that relation? What are the potentials and limits of present politics and organization around equality and legality? What successes and limitations has it met? The second was, how does economic life shape our imaginations about what sexual freedom will look like? What role would the state play in a left that seeks to decrease both human economic precariousness and human dependence on the economy more generally? What forms of personal public relation are possible now? What relationship ought the left fight for between love, the private, and the public? What do we mean by a liberated sexuality? Does the demand for equality often homogenize the formerly marginal into normative bonds like family, marriage, uh, monogamy? Or is sexual emancipation necessarily antagonistic to the sexual mainstream? Are neither of these positions adequate? Our panelists will each be giving seven to ten minutes for their opening remarks. After allowing a brief time for responses, we'll then open up the discussion to audience questions and answers. So I'd like to thank the panelists, and now I will introduce them in the order that they're speaking. So our first speaker is Evan Cool. Evan is an organizer and educator within queer and working class struggles. Evan has been involved in the queer community since he was a student at Cape Breton University, providing public education and peer support through the Student Union Sexual Diversity Center. He's had a hand in sexuality and gender education and GSA support through his work in the AIDS service industry and devotes his activist efforts to labor solidarity, anti-poverty, and mobilizing communities to address queer phobia, transphobia, and queer and trans health. Okay, so that's me. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, before I really get into it, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, I'm going to be focusing on, um, for the first half of what I'm saying, on history, and I just wanted to acknowledge that the history I'm focusing on is entirely Eurocentric. Um, it uh, leaves out and glosses over a lot about how a lot of different people used to do things, so I just wanted to uh, say that up front. Um, and also, given that I'm going to be covering large chunks of history and um, very broad issues, I'm probably going to be glossing over even the tensions within left movements. So um, don't come out of this uh, my talk thinking um, everything on the left is a happy family where everyone <laughs> loves each other and there's never any disagreement. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to uh, start in pre-World War II uh, Europe, well actually uh, 1917, so um, at the end of World War I. Uh, this was a time of immense social unrest. Uh, there was an economic crisis, um, countries were suffering aftermath of wars, a time not actually unlike our own in a lot of ways. Uh, but through, um, through these crises uh, rose up a very strong anti-capitalist workers' movement in European countries. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about Germany and Russia. Um, in Germany, um, little known fact, but before the Weimar Republic uh, that, well, was the uh, eventual government that led to the rise of fascism under um, Hitler and the Nazi Party, um, there was a brief time, a year, between 1918 and 1919, where... Um, the workers' movement actually overthrew the imperial uh, government of Germany and established a social democratic state. Um, one of the things they did in this brief period of time was turn over a royal palace for use of the, um, uh, as a national archives for the gay and lesbian movement of Germany. When I first found this out, I kind of had um, a bit of a, wait, 1919, there was a gay and lesbian rights movement anywhere. Um, but from 1870 on, um, 
there was within academic and activist circles a movement towards queer equality but also broader discussions about sexual liberation uh, within the workers movement these were kind of taken up as questions um, socialists Marxists anarchists should be discussing and asking themselves um, you see I guess the progression of this thought more clearly in the rise of the Soviet Union um, in 1917 as Many of you may be aware there was a workers' revolution in Russia that led to the establishment of um, the uh, USSR. Um, this came um, after the overthrow of the czarist government, uh, the royalty. Um, the first criminal code of Soviet Russia uh, decriminalized, uh, decriminalized homosexual acts, but more interestingly, um, same-sex unions uh, were recognized as were uh, unions of more than two people. Um, this came out of the work of Alexandra Kolonte, who is a Ukrainian-born Bolshevik. Uh, after participating in the Russian Social Democratic Party, um, she became um, the first People's Commissioner of Social Welfare. Um, what was interesting about Alexandra, um, her writing, um, she actually has um, a fictional work um, that discusses polyamory th using um, bees as characters. I'd recommend checking it out. It's uh, kind of an interesting read. Uh, but she was a very strong free love advocate. Um, she even made a number of people within her own party very uncomfortable with how strongly she um, uh, was uh, kind of pushing a sexual liberation agenda. Um, her um, politic was based out of the notion that um, what we had to deal with and uh, what information we had to uh, process um, our understandings of sexuality, gender, the family, were pretty flawed. We had the conservative uh, tradition, religion, marriage, family, social order, blah, 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 blah. None of us in this room probably want to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, the rising um, uh, bourgeois uh, ruling class in Europe, um, there, within uh, segments of that there was a liberal notion of free love um, that basically uh, came at things from the perspective that um, once uh, we decriminalized, um, decriminalized all sexual acts and abolished religious marriage in favor of civil marriage, we would all be fine, uh, sexual liberation would happen. Um, she was quite clear that a socialist Marxist understanding of um, sexuality, gender, sex, marriage was pretty essential to actually achieve sexual liberation. Um, she saw, she focused mainly on um, questions of, uh, of women in, um, under capitalism and in society. And she, um, like many Marxists, um, uh, pointed to the beginning of uh, the capitalist notion of family where uh, that was the first time we really saw a, a split between what was public and what was private in that way where a family became a private affair, an individual matter. Um, she viewed this as not an ideal state of affairs um, because she believed that in order to truly understand these things, we had to root them in uh, the social context of capitalism, where due to unequal distribution of wealth and power, that um, just reforming laws in the end wouldn't provide an emancipatory, um, an emancipatory framework for people to uh, live, breathe, and practice sexuality. Um, now, the reason why we may not be familiar with uh, these reforms under the Soviet Union is because they lasted for about five years. Um, when um, the uh, when things uh, started to transition um, to Stalin, uh, Stalin being um, the leader of the USSR, we unfortunately saw all these reforms um, rolled back. And my apologies to any Marxists in the room um, or any Stalinists in the room. You're probably rolling your eyes and thinking I'm a Trotskyist, but um, uh, so I wanted to bring this up um, because things have changed quite a bit since this time. Um, we're now at a point where within Canada, anyway, we um, have made some major achievements in, um, in uh, equality and liberal, liberal capitalist terms. Um, a lot of the questions that uh, these folks in the 20s and 30s would have been focusing on, we maybe don't talk about so much anymore. So I want to bring it to the present. Um, now, 
I'm sure we all know Trudeau's famous statement, the state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation. Um, more or less, I'd say that this is the approach a lot of people take when thinking about questions of uh, queer equality and sexual freedom. And I'm not known for subtlety. I think that's bullshit. Um, we... Um, Conceiving of sexuality in those terms uh, gives little space and attention to what I would view as crucial questions of sexual justice. Um, namely, uh, within the feminist movement right now, there's a very large discussion about um, sexual violence, um, uh, enthusiastic consent, rape culture, um, domestic violence. Uh, just taking um, the approach that sexuality should be a private individual affair kind of doesn't give us a lot of space to address those kinds of questions. Um, as well, uh, when you're looking at trans issues in, uh, in Canada right now, so many of these come down to economic justice issues rather than issues of individual expression. Um, we're dealing with uh, access to health care, um, housing, um, unemployment, uh, transpulse, uh, Transpulse, the survey of uh, trans folks in Ontario, revealed that um, uh, transgender uh, communities in uh, Ontario have the highest rates of education and also the highest rates of unemployment. Um, this, once again, conceiving of uh, sexual freedom in individualistic terms doesn't allow us to really address those questions. Um, probably running low on time, so I'll bring her home. Um, the uh, main thrust, I guess, of how I think we should think about these things um, is to start refocusing sexual liberation from questions of individual expression and freedom to back to, as many of uh, those uh, folks in the workers' movement in um, Europe uh, before World War II would have thought of them as um, targeting what we could view as the institutions of, of uh, sexual and gender oppression. Um, the uh, heteropatriarchal construction of the family, for one. Um, this is one of the only legitimate social groupings liberal, liberal capitalist states recognize, and I think we have to think very critically and carefully about that, what that means, um, how, we, uh, how we engage with uh, that, um, that institution, as well um, broader questions about uh, capitalism itself, um, especially for, um, uh, for trans people and uh, communities right now. Um, we uh, see that needs of uh, very desperate needs of a uh, minority can be overlooked if they aren't profitable, if um, they uh, might turn off a consumer base. Um, we um, also, when uh, we're thinking about sex workers, um, that isn't just a matter of individual freedom and expression. Um, I, uh, would argue we have to uh, think about sex work as any other form of work where um, people, working people, uh, should be uh, should be in the position where they can organize to uh, defend their rights and dignity. Um, so basically what I would argue for sexual liberation to move forward, we need to um, kind of broaden our focus, uh, refocus towards institutions, and maybe think outside of uh, what we would conceive of strictly uh, queer issues. Who else, uh, who else faces oppression and stigmatization as a result of our definitions and ideas of the family? Um, I would argue that single parent families, non-traditional families in general, um, these are, whether they're straight, uh, queer, otherwise, uh, we should be engaging um, with, uh, uh, we should be uh, asking questions in uh, conjunction with uh, other people who are experiencing oppression um, on the basis of sexuality and gender. Um, we need to uh, think especially, too, about communities of color and youth rights. Um, uh, when I was working in GSA's in GSA support, I noticed that um, a lot of the issues that uh, youth had, uh, the queer youth had, some of them were just because they were youth. Youth aren't taken seriously and um, aren't uh, given the, um, I guess, same attention in society that, well, we'd like to see. Um, so I can keep rambling on, and I kind of feel like I'm getting to that point. Um, <laughs> more will come up in the Q&A, and yeah, if there's any questions, I can't wait to hear them. <laughs> Thanks. Our next speaker is Kevin Kindred. Kevin's a lawyer and activist whose work focuses on the LGBT community and secularism. 
His activist work includes legal and law reform work, public education, and serving as a media spokesman. He currently serves as chair of the Nova Scotia Rainbow Action Project, a group that deals with issues of sexual orientation and gender identity. Thank you very much. Um, so just even from that background as sort of a lawyer who works within the movement, I think you can already presume that I occupy sort of a certain tradition, a certain element of the, of the, of the queer rights movement. And I'm not apologetic about that, but I certainly want to own it. So um, I come from a place in the movement that is very much could be uh, characterized as liberal and reformist. Um, and could be contrasted with a more radical aspect of the movement. Uh, and I, the, the way I would characterize that distinction is sort of the liberal impulse in the movement uh, it looks to uh, use and reform existing power structures as, as a means of furthering the, the goals of the movement, and the more radical impulse looks to sort of attack and re reformulate or uh, ignore or exist outside existing power structures as a way of forwarding um, the goals of the movement. And, I'm, I'm one who sees a, a role for both, but uh, I certainly occupy and speak from uh, something that looks much more like a, ri a liberal impulse in the movement. So I don't want to be here as a poser and pretending to, to speak from a more radical standpoint than I, than I really do. Um, so from firmly s sitting within that, uh, that liberal mode, that liberal impulse of the movement, uh, I think I still have a perspective on... Um, on sexual liberation and on the way that a more radical impulse uh, can help further sexual liberation. So I guess from my standpoint, I, I guess I would make three observations really um, about uh, the way forward for sexual liberation. And again, this is coming from a, a, a liberal view, which is not the only view on, on the movement, but it's, it's, it's the viewpoint from which I observe things. Um, so first of all, uh, the the sexual the project of sexual liberation as it would be envisioned by a legal and law reform a very liberal uh, perspective is not a by any stretch of the imagination a complete project that would be my first observation and I'll, I'll say what I mean by that um, secondly there have been strategic choices made uh, within the the liberal law reform kind of branch of the movement, mode of the movement, that have shut down opportunities for different kinds of discussions about sexual liberation. Um, and thirdly, I think more structurally, the fact that the liberal and law reform movement has dominated in the past 25-ish years what we think of as the movement has closed down possibilities for uh, sexual liberation or for more, a more liberation type uh, approach towards queer rights. I'll explain a little bit what I mean by, by each of those observations. So first of all, um, the project of sexual liberation, as it would purely be envisioned by a law reform, a legal reformist, um, is far from complete. Um, you know, Evan referred to what probably is the classic way of thinking about sexual liberation as a as a law reformist. The state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation, um, and most Canadians are under the impression that the criminal code reflects that. And a liberal would be pretty comfortable saying that a criminal code that truly reflected that would be good evidence of sexual liberation. Um, most Canadians do not realize that our, the Criminal Code of Canada does not in any way reflect that principle. We, a lie has been structured and fed to us um, about reforms made to the Criminal Code as in order to convince us that we have a liberal uh, criminal code that uh, is uh, that facilitates sexual liberation, and that is untrue. So the the moment at which the, the that phrase the state has no role has no place in the bedrooms of the nation that was cr crystallized. That was Pierre Trudeau's statement. It was crystallized around reforms made in began in sixty seven and acted in sixty nine to the criminal code, which supposedly, which you probably have been told, um, decriminalized sodomy or decriminalized homosexuality, and we talk about you know, the decriminalization of sodomy and homosexuality in Canada. And in fact, that did not happen. Um, the law reforms that were passed in 1969 did not remove sodomy from the criminal code. They removed the word sodomy. They replaced it with a criminal offense called anal intercourse, which is still a crime in Canada. Probably you, you, a lot of you are not aware of that. Um, if you flip through the criminal code, you will see an offense of anal intercourse, which is what Pierre Trudeau introduced into the criminal code for the first time. It is better than the old offense of sodomy because consent is a defense. Um, but in order to consent to anal intercourse and therefore have it not be a crime, you have to be above the age of 18. Originally it was 21. The age of consent for any other kind of sexual activity used to be 14, 16 under 
ver uh, changes uh, imposed by this conservative government. Um, secondly, in order to consent to anal intercourse, uh, there can only be two participants or two people in the room in which the act is occurring. Um, so again, there are, there's criminal laws preventing sexual activity in public, but uniquely to anal intercourse, um, public means any room which has more than two people in it. So that is probably not what you were told when you were sold the story that, uh, that the state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation or that Canada decriminalized homosexuality or decriminalized sodomy. So that is the shining example of the liberalization of our criminal code to reflect you know, sexual liber liberation, and it is a failed example. And absolutely no other sexual provisions have been, se sexual offenses have been truly liberalized. So the, the principle that the state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation is almost nowhere reflected in our criminal code. So purely as a law reform project, we are next to nowhere in terms of achieving sexual liberation, and most people do not understand that. So that's, that's, that's my point number one. Uh, point number two is certain choices made by the law reform impulse within the, the movement have shut down possibilities for uh, other kinds of discussions about sexual liberation. And here I think of same-sex marriage, for example. So I'm not one who, uh, you know, I was part of the advocacy movement for same-sex marriage. I'm not one who sees that as a step back for the movement in any means, by any means. But um, in the course of how we pitched that and uh, sort of advocated for it, um, we shut down the, the potential for other kinds of discussions. So we, for example, when challenged to say, well, if, if we have same-sex marriage, then what does that mean for polygamy and what does that do for our laws against polyamory and what does that do for laws against adult consensual incest and all of those sorts of other things that are broadly speaking related to the, con the question of sexual liberation. And instead of maturely and sophisticatingly saying, well, the state also has to think about whether it has an interest in regulating uh, polyamory or regulating polygamy or regulating adult sexual in uh, consensual incest, um, we said that's offensive. You can't compare uh, same-sex marriage to gross ridiculous things like polygamy and, uh, and incest and all those things. So, so rather than use that as a moment in which to question the legitimacy of the state in regulating our sex lives in those other ways, um, we shut that down. Um, and in that way, we've sort of failed the cause of sexual liberation um, by moving forward another agenda, which I think I, I probably disagree with some, with some people on this, but which I think is a sign of progress for the movement. Um, but we did it in a way that left out of the cold and a, a lot of other discussion, potential discussions about sexual liberation. Uh, my third point is that, so th those are strategic choices, but I also think that the fact that the law reform movement or that the liberal impulse in the movement tends to dominate the queer rights movement is in and of itself very limiting about, uh, limits the movement in, in what we can accomplish. So I'm not uncomfortable being within that impulse in the, in the movement, but I am uncomfortable with the fact that that's dominant in the movement, that, that, that the general public thinks of the Queer Rights Project as a law reform project. And the movement has sort of developed to think of the Queer Rights Project as a law reform project. So for, for example, it, it becomes sort of like what you know, Maslow said, um, when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Um, so we have thought of queer rights problems as problems for which the appropriate solution is a legal solution. Um, and that is good for many kinds of queer rights problems. The fact that people face discrimination and have no power structures they can rely on to kind of fight back against that discrimination, um, you know, that's good. That is a, a legitimate law reform problem and a law reform solution speaks well to that. But for example, when we're confronted with hate speech, um, which I think is a legitimate problem and much more serious problem than say the inability of, uh, of queer people to get married to each other, um, we have become very comfortable with very uncomfortable legal impulses to, as a strategy for confronting hate speech. So as a movement, we have started to embrace censorship and embrace state interference with what we are able to say and how we're able to criticize each other. And I think that is a really, it's an example of, uh, law, of the law reform impulse sort of warping the movement to be uh, far less liberationist and far less radical uh, than it otherwise could be. Um, so, those are, those are sort of my three observations from the position that I sit uh, within the movement on the, the future for sexual liberation. I think that the law reform impulse within the movement, the, the, the impulse that I occupy, absolutely will continue to be a part. I think it's sort of less and less a part. Um, 
there was a period of dominance that probably is called the rights revolution. It coincides nicely with the, the charter, although the charter is in, in Canada the start of that movement. There was a period in which the law reform movement was dominant and that made the movement a very specific kind of thing, for good and for bad. Um, I think the law reform impulse within, in, within the movement will survive and still will continue to provide uh, fruitful strategies for some of the goals of the movement, but I think we need to recognize that that in the future will be the less dominant, or hope that it will be the less dominant uh, impulse within the movement, and that space will be made for other kinds of strategies. And that's, that's basically my yeah. Uh, Our third speaker is Karen Cope. Karen is the immigrant daughter of once radical urban Christian missionaries who worked tirelessly, and alas, unsuccessfully, in the 1960s and 70s for an end to poverty and racism. As a consequence, she has many theories about why the revolutionary fervor of the 1960s, particularly in the United States and Canada, has faded so thoroughly by the 1980s and 90s. An activist herself, green, feminist queer, rural, she is also a poet, a researcher, a photographer, a citizen journalist, a sailor, an active blogger, and an associate professor of English and Critical Studies at NASCAD, where she is currently teaching a course called Queer Theory, Sex, Gender, Art. Karen? Thank you. Um, it's very interesting that we followed in this, in this row, because I, I was going to start with this comment about how it would seem, one way or the other, the state is never not in the bedrooms <laughs> of the nation. Um, <laughs> And precisely in a lot of the ways that Kevin has elaborated, um, the letter of the law is one thing, but what actually happens is another thing. So um, being something of a philosopher by training, um, I can't really talk too much about the law. But what I can do is try to ask some questions that maybe would back us up and ask us what our assumptions are likely to be in any conversation about sexual liberation. Because I think that we operate with some very important assumptions that may or may not be true. And, but, and before I get to the ones that are the most important to me, I want to just make another kind of observation, and that is that um, there is an interesting relationship in, in the history of philosophy, um, but also in our present moment, between what we could call loosely moral thinking and the law. Um, we're all interested in this question, what should the future of sexual liberation be? We wouldn't be here if we weren't interested in that question. That is a moral interest. Even if you're not interested in controlling other people's behavior, you're certainly interested in their behavior, what they're doing, when, with whom, and, and you're kind of interested in moving this conversation one way or the other. That, that moral interest, Aristotle argues that that has to come before politics. Um, that moral interest turns towards and informs our political actions, and it also informs um, the law, for better and for worse. Um, so, um, although the law obviously uh, enshrines uh, protections for people that it once prosecuted in a limited sort of way, it also doesn't. It continues to eat away at us, to look at us, to um, not um, imagine families that consist of more than two adult partners and, and so on. Um, so I, I want to just think a little bit more about this moral, political question. Um, um, Foucault takes this up in the second volume of the history of sexuality, um, The Use of Pleasure. And he's, he's interested in asking, um, is, this, is this relationship between morals and a kind of political regulatory relation to sexuality, is that a consequence of, say, Christian religious fervor in, in a European setting or some kind of religious um, interest. And so he goes back and he starts to look at the ancient Greeks who don't really, it, for the most part, have religious systems that are um, prescriptive around sexuality. After all, the gods are always busy doing things that get them into trouble or create havoc in their relations with the other gods and so on. Um, so, so, and, they're not, and they're not really punished for it, right? These are just shit happens, right? It's kind of in that category. Um, so, so he's interested in looking at that. And um, so he, here he, he says, well, yes, um, sorting out who does what with whom and where and when and in which circumstances and whether you praise it or damn it um, has often been an issue for um, politics, um, for moralizing um, and for the law. 
Um, but even in societies, if using his example, even in spaces where, say, religion doesn't come to bear on it, where a certain kind of negativity doesn't necessarily come to bear on it, he says there's often a moral problematization of pleasures. Um, so um, he goes on to argue that moralizing about sexuality and other bodily pleasures, how, um, how to eat, how much to eat, how to drink, how much to drink, how to behave, all of, all of those things, and sexuality com- comes under those, under those rubrics, um, was for certain ancient Greeks, and this is his case study, there could be others, right? Um, it wasn't about justifying interdictions, that's to say, um, justifying saying no, or what the limit is, but he says stylizing a freedom, a means of developing for the smallest minority of the population made up of free adult males, what he calls an aesthetics of existence, the purposeful art of a freedom perceived as a power game. In other words, um, sorting out what your moral compass is and following it, narrowing it in some way, becomes a way of enacting a certain kind of uh, set of power relations. Um, conf- um, uh, conf- creating a kind of club, if you will, of, of people who do things a certain way, and so then attend to how people do things a certain other way. And in some sense, you could say that um, uh, most societies create skins around them that way, even, even um, um, L- LGBTQ movements, right? Um, um, we, we form little groups, and, and we have ways that things should be done. Um, and we have certain styles of, of what's right or more right or less right and, and so on. And, and that's in some sense our moral working um, to regulate our behavior and other people's behavior. And, and um, when the law comes to bear on it, it, it works through, through these mechanisms. Now, Foucault calls this the aesthetics, this kind of moral aesthetics, um, the, um, governing the powerful. Um, why should we care about this, right? Why should this matter to us here? And I think it should because it points to a handful of things to think about around sexuality. Um, sexuality is, as we know it, again, we're all here, <laughs> um, w- um, is highly politicized even when it's not criminalized. Uh, we exhibit a moral concern by caring about the question, which way forward for sexual liberation. Um, Two, ethical and moral concerns pick up the ball that politics drops or leaves alone. That's to say, um, the law does a certain amount of stuff, and it may be driven by ethical or moral concerns, but we tend to have them about things that it doesn't even think about. Um, And three, if we can't escape this moral impulse, now I'm not arguing we can't, I'm just saying, well, you know, where's its limits? I'm not seeing that it it has a limit. Um, If we can't escape the moral impulse, how might we nevertheless dream of stylizing it? So this is a place now that I want to ask my, my um, question, because the law and our styles of morality do interact, I think, down the line. Um, um, what are the things that we might think about that are the unthought of our time, the taken for granted aspects of our moralities, even if they are very, very broad around sexuality? Um, and I think that's probably including, that probably includes the word morality, which is probably making some of you have a little bit rictus. Like, that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> um, um, but it's there, right? Because we care. So somehow it walks into the room with us as soon as we care about something. Um, if you look at the contemporary contours of debate around sexuality and sexual liberation, there are a couple of assumptions that those debates make. One, that we're all human and that humans are the only creatures who matter. Human liberty and transformation must be safeguarded at all costs. And often the argument is, if you don't start there and focus there, you have let people down, okay? And two, everyone is urban. Um, Obviously, I know those aren't absolute assumptions, but many, many of our assumptions about the future of sexuality presuppose both of those elements. So what about our relationship to the environment and to other creatures and materials? Why restrict our dreaming or our styles of relating to the domain of the human alone? If we're going to call for a shift for an opening of a moral compass towards novel horizons, shouldn't we begin there? 
what would it mean to pose and reimagine a sexually liberatory future in relationship to a less human-centered rubric? And I'm just going to give you some examples. Several things would be possible if we allow ourselves to open that up. We might see and value relationships that are already there. Uh, now, you're going to laugh, probably, but how many people report not necessarily sexual relationships to their cat, but an attunement of their cats to their sexual relationships with other people? What's going on there? Um, is that like, it, I, I, okay, it may seem really trivial, but if you don't attend to certain things in your environment, you're not thinking through the, the questions to think through. So if you attend to things like that, you might cultivate new kinds of relationships um, and imagine the fullness of our, our being, um, not as something that comes when we're more clearly marked as human, but when we're more clearly marked as related to other kinds of beings. So, so generally, within Marxist circles, the assumption is human progress counts. Um, you are What we are concerned about is more people being marked as more fully human. We are indeed concerned about those things, except what happens when that means that we have a version of humans as the top of a great chain of being in which they direct and exploit everything underneath them. Then we start to have a set of problems, and I think that those are very much a part of the unthought moral or the unthought thought of our time around sexuality. Um, so I'll end with some kind of ways of imagining here, um, dreaming. Who has not written, so this kind of like poetry, so if you bear with me. Who has not written a lover like a horse, or imagined lovemaking as a kind of flying? We writhe and fishtail through the atmosphere, breathing noisily, showing off, reaching, spouting. Who has not sported feathers, leather, stones, a bit of fur? In pursuit of love and sensuous pleasure, we consume animal and mineral matter as nourishment and aphrodisiacs. We change our appearances, shave, dress up or down, bedeck ourselves, dance, parade, cover ourselves in oils, perfumes, simply materials. Some collect stuffed animals or imagine themselves small or large furry creatures. We invent pet names for one another, for various body parts. My little cabbage, my bunny rabbit, my furry bear, my dandelion, my aspergusto, that's a quote. I must be loved. <laughs> I got lots of contributions to this last room. I, I, this is important not because these are um, absolutely private, but because in some sense these are unspeakable within our conversations around what public sexuality is. The language of gender with its separations and oppositions, its masculine and feminine designations, even when those are prized open and torn apart, isn't as flexible and apt as our multiplied sensuous explorations and expressions of these other animal, vegetable, mineral embodiments. And we exploit these resources absolutely also, right? So we stand in a very particular relationship to most of these things when we say that human beings are on the top. In order, I, I think in part, to keep ourselves from joining the flux of them in some way, becoming um, uh, some part of them. So I, I want to argue that, that very often in imagining the future of sexual liberation, we cast the notion, our terms of sexuality, far, far, far too narrowly. We restrict them to categories of gender, which we may prize open, but we, we don't allow ourselves to think about what it means to imagine that future with human beings as dominant and dominating. So we're, we're concerned about opening up opportunity, protecting rights of, looking after human beings, including more people in the roster of those who are human. And that, it seems all to be very important, but the flip side of that, interestingly, is, is um, that we carry on unquestioningly as if to be human means to be absolutely dominant and capable of exploiting and all of these other terms as if they don't matter. So how do we think our way through this conundrum? I don't have an easy answer. I mean, it's easy for me to write poetry. That's different than coming up with some kind of... of thoughtful solution to this question. I mean, it is a it is the research project in a sense I set myself for the next number of, of years. Um, I'll just add one more note and then um, kind of let this go. I'm sure we have, can have many more conversations about this. 
It's worth noting that the word bestiality first appears in Western European languages as a negative coinage, that's to say, a bad thing, sometime in the late Middle Ages or early Renaissance. Um, there's a series of medieval bestiaries, um, imaginations of com combinations of people and animals and plants and, and so on that are published before that fanciful moralized accounts of admixtures of things. And um, the emergence of bestiality coincides roughly with the invention of the notion of the human and the birth of humanism in Europe, which, for better and for worse, is still a legacy that we are living with. So, um, so that, even for all of our political critique, that remains in the background um, and remains for us to um, spade, do the spade work to, to dig up, I think. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> So our last speaker is Ashley Weger. Ashley was a student and activist in Chicago before she moved to Toronto to do her master's in English at York University. She currently works as a nanny and enjoys thinking and writing about the curation of childhood, the queer community and politics, and human sexuality. Like me, she's also a member of the Platypus Affiliated Society. And I feel really left out because I didn't quote Pierre Trudeau at all. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it I'm American. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I hope I'm still part of the in, in the crowd. <laughs> um, I'm going to begin my remarks tonight at the risk of seeming pedantic with a simple question. Why sexual liberation? That is to say, why and how have our erotic lives become the loving, panting, moaning, sweating, passionate, and painful material for a political struggle? In preparing for tonight's panel, this question was met with agnostic hesitancy and self-doubt and a blank page for quite a few nights. If why was too difficult a place to begin, then perhaps who? Who constitutes the sexual liberation left? What are the proper opinions to advocate? Are we lobbying around the world for marriage equality, or do we resist that institution on principle? Do we indulge, celebrate, and protect pornography, or do we work towards its demise? Are we advocates for sex work legalization and protection, or abolitionists of prostitution? All or none of these positions are arguably radical, left-wing, or emancipatory, devoid of their context and ignorant of their historical constitution. Presented with such contra contradictions, how can we make sense of the obstacles plaguing sexual liberation struggles in the present? Is the problem inclusion into already existing institutions and conventions, standard and acceptable cellophane wrapped samples of sex? Or is it to produce and affirm alternatives? Are either of these approaches or combinations of them ends in themselves? Is our struggle that of a disempowered and discriminated against minority against a phobic, heteronormative, patriarchal majority? How do we negotiate natural and socially constructed desires and drives? Is favoring one of these distinctions necessarily left-wing, or are both at risk of unintentionally borrowing from conservative rhetoric and categories? What do we make of prime ministers and presidents embracing some of us while shunning and brutalizing others? What do we make of pinkwashing, a practice that uses our history and struggles as its blank canvas on which to paint an entirely different picture, one where we are an included and celebrated component of society? Do we satiate or soften our desire for substantial social change through these gestures and half measures? Do we get complacent when we celebrate our pride instead of marching for the sexual freedoms we have yet to realize? That was a lot of questions. And I have few resolutions to any of them. Perhaps I now believe I committed a fatal, if understandable, error in conceiving this panel tonight. Its gaze is fixed towards the future, and it's in need of a reorientation. Why sexual liberation cannot be answered by propositions of which way forward? To attempt to make sense of and evaluate our current moment and the future it might bear, we should first glance at the history at our heels. That understanding these problems requires picking away at the residue of a history we need to remember and a self mythologization we need to overcome. The standpoint of the present, then, gives us little cause to celebrate or despair, affirm or dismiss. Instead, we are left with our belief unsettled that we have indeed all this time been moving forward, culminating, perhaps instead charting a course far more chaotic. <coughs> While human beings have been having sex from the very start, I would argue that the advent of sexuality as we know it today occurs within a comparatively minuscule portion of human existence in the wake of the rise of capitalism and modern society. Perhaps to avoid the tragically misinformed Marxist caricature, I do not mean to say that because capitalism and sexuality are related, our sexual struggles must be subservient to our proletarianization. Rather, I intend to suggest and hopefully demonstrate that capitalism is relevant to the conversation because the forms our lives take under capital, as wage laborers, as owning and selling our bodies and our work, 
redefines humanity's relation and understanding of the self and society. That this transformation of human life precedes and shapes how we think and talk about our sexual identities today. As feudalism ripped at the seams, society ruptured, land once common now enclosed, persons once peasants now workers. While alienation and oppression are hardly modern, under capitalism, it is work itself and the necessity to do it that dominates, brutalizes, and shapes our subjectivity. Just imagine being the 15th generation of your family tied to work on your lord's land. The point of your life is to reproduce the conditions inherited from your ancestors and to secure the same for generations to come, all to the service of one outside yourself, who in turn guarantees your security. A person's history did not change, a family's history did not change, the overwhelming majority of human existence did not change. And then capitalism, in all its destructive force, severs this link to the land and the past. As these radical shifts in society began to materialize, people became simultaneously autonomous and yet socially defined and confined. Couple this with a mass migration of a newly formed working class tumultuously finding new life and new work in urban centers, away if not amputated from old ties, you can begin to get a sense of the ground from which modern sexuality grew. Self-creation, self-expression, even self-indulgence and self-love became newly possible and desirable for individuals seeking to make themselves in the world. This craving of an erotic and romantic life, a sexual identity fundamentally different from the past and oft supposed as counter to one's domination by capital, resulted in the contest of tradition, custom, and conventions long upheld. Workers by day, producing and reproducing a system which had freed them from bondage only to demand their hand in their own self-alienation, began to partake in the partial freedom possible under capitalism, a rebuke and retreat in the cultivation of personal lives, sexual identities, love, spaces that were ours, spaces where we could be our true selves, where we felt our pleasure, pain, companionship, solitude. Of course, our spaces only existed within a greater space of capital, never free from dependence, influence, restraint, or reaction. Not by coincidence, the fight for sexual liberation happens concurrently and, to a great extent, within a fight for, for human liberation, the successes of failures and failures which constitute the history of the left. So as long-held cultural and political practices began to be questioned, reformed, or rejected, sometimes violently, romantic and reactionary visions of the family and morality attempted to counter and bridle the creative force of capitalism capable of unsettling tradition established for centuries. Such as the history of struggles for marriage reform, divorce, the decriminalization of homosexuality, abortion, anti-sodomy laws. As radical as the expansion of sexual possibilities might seem, however, it is not necessarily so. Rather, as modern history trudges forward, sexuality has begun to take on an increasingly apparent dual character, simultaneously revolted and revered. Because sexuality gives human beings a sense of themselves capital denies, even if it's fleeting or incomplete, it is an effective tool of sublimation, where the few hours we have each day to ourselves serve to pacify the frustrated urge to determine ourselves and our lives as we continue to need to work to live. This is why it's understandable that capitalism no, long, no longer needs the patriarchal commandment of abstinence, virginity, and chastity. On the contrary, sexuality, turned on and off, channeled and exploited in countless forms by the material and cultural industry, cooperates with the process of manipulation insofar as it is absorbed, institutionalized, and administered by society. As long as sexuality is bridled, it is tolerated. That is to say, there's something fundamentally different in struggles for sexual freedom and self-definition and us having healthy sex lives, even if the two often are difficult to tell apart. For a true instinctual erotic life, the relations that generate pleasure is by no means that healthy sex life that in most advanced industrial co countries today is encouraged by all sectors of the economy, from the cosmetics industry to psychotherapy. Why does any of this matter in the present? Because in our, all our particular demands, no matter how just and worthwhile they might be, no matter how repugnant and vile violence and discrimination is towards those who find themselves ostracized on the basis of their sexual identities, we lack a sense of the genesis and meaning of our struggle, a sensibility that needs recovering. The fight for sexual freedom means fighting for everyone to make decisions about their personal lives without fear or harm or punishment. This means fighting for one person's right to have health textbook sex and others that would make a libertine blush. Is the state of our sex lives at present, both on the left and beyond it, a necessary outcome, or could history have played out entirely differently? Without the sense that we are a part of history, a history ongoing and unfinished, a history of individuals attempting to change society and themselves in the process, we can only struggle to free what already exists, what appears natural, original, and ahistorical, but is actually the ossification of conditions of domesticity, sexuality, and legality, as they were socially and historically created. We are left yelling, abolish the family, without understanding why the family has become a pillar of social stability in our world today. 
The Marxist social theorist Theodore Adorno once suggested that in an unfree society, sexual freedom is hardly any more conceivable than any other form of freedom. It's precisely for this reason that I am able to give a tentative answer to my first question. Why sexual liberation? Because it is something we crave and need, but is mutilated by the world in which we live. I simply contribute an amendment. As we push on the limits of possibility in our world, we must never resign from the task to recognize the freedom promised by capitalism cannot be given by it. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm going to start the question and answer session. Um, I think uh, we'll try to take questions maybe in groups of threes, first round at least, depending on how many there are. So, Can we contribute them too? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you may. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, just uh, feel free to raise your hand. I have one I can post to Adam. Sure. Um, obviously, this Trudeau quote came up quite a bit. Um, and everyone, I think, kind of interpreted it in a different way. And I've definitely tried to get at it, even though I didn't use the quote itself. Um, but you seem to be the one that thought it was false to the greatest extent. Mm -hmm. um, is that because you think that it's kind of, um, as Kevin pointed out, there's like a veneer of, of falseness to it, that um, it says one thing and yet it implies something totally differently? Or should... Could we ever live in a society in which the state stayed out of our bedrooms and that was a good thing? Or is it that the society we live in like necessitates that we do something different? Um, well, I guess like my main two critiques of that approach is one in is uh, first would be like how it actually frames the issue of sexuality, uh, framing it as a private individual thing. Um, uh, like I say, that's where I was coming from um, with a uh, strong opposition to it. But um, it's also just really untrue. Uh, the state uh, defines the state defines the one legally recognized institution that we were traditionally told we could have sex in the family. Um, and at the time, um, Trudeau said that I don't believe he had any intention of abolishing um, heteropatriarchal family structures. So um, I think in some ways it's um, uh, kind of a smokescreen and a misdirect for actually understanding sexual liberation. Okay. I, I could just, like, there are other critical perspectives. I mean, the, the idea of the state having no place in the, even within a law reform impulse, like, some of the most severe types of sexual uh, repression and violence happen within the bedrooms of the nation. So it's a very like yeah. there's a very, there's a feminist criticism of the idea of sexual liberation being achieved through the privatization of 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 uh, or the, the removal of the state from our sex lives. So that that kind of just the power structures that then swoop in when the state's power structure is removed are probably anti-feminist and and misogynistic. So that like there is a perspective on on criticizing that impulse of that sexual liberation as well. I mean, my, my point in, in raising it is not necessarily that it's the, that it's the wrong way of thinking about um, sexual liberation. It's just that it's, we've been told that it's the state of affairs, and it's, you know, it clearly is not. Yeah. <laughs> what, whatever you think about whether that should or shouldn't be the state of affairs, or whether making that the state of affairs should or shouldn't be ultimately a legitimate goal, it's just we have been lied to in, in a very constructive way. Um, and that lie kind of focuses around that quote in a very unique Canadian context. Okay. Um, if no one else has any questions, maybe I, I will try to ask some. Um, specifically, I mean, if we're talking about um, this sort of, the, the dichotomy that I felt in some of the remarks was between, uh, between legal activity and uh, on one hand, and then the sort of extra legal, like institutional social critique. What I think is interesting, in, and that I think Kevin's remarks got to, is that you know that legal reform hasn't been realized. Um, so I think you know, in terms of how the the two are, are opposed to each other, um, that um, you know the idea that legal reform didn't uh, didn't reach the what it what it attained to is kind of an interesting perspective because we are supposed to have this situation where we have formal equality but actual social inequality when we actually still don't even have formal equality. 
I guess that's not a question this morning. Just yeah. Well, I'm, 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 I'm not <laughs> sure what. The most it's grave yeah. Baptist. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Don't you agree? <laughs> <laughs> why, why yes? Uh, no. I mean, I'm not even sure what formal equality means. And and part of like, if when I criticize the the, the dominance of the the dominance of the movement by the mode that I represent within the movement, mm. also, I'm sort of critical of the concept of equality as the as the main goal of the movement. So like being like uh, equality is constructed around the notion at least legal uh, equality is constructed around the notions of being treated like someone else as opposed to just being free from interference or having the kind of freedom to, to live the way, the mm -hmm. way that we like and so that kind of uh, it's the reason why same sex marriage became such a primary goal of the movement because we started to think ourselves as of ourselves as primarily a movement about achieving equality and the one uh, blatant area in which our lives were not treated the same way as heterosexual lives was by denying uh, the ability to get married so um that focus on equality sort of became a, um, shaped us into a certain kind of movement. And again, not critical of that, it's just the dominance of, of that. So, so when you ask questions about like formal equality, or even mm. constructing it, is it as, a, as formal equality versus social equality, kind of almost removes liberation from the mm. equation as, as, a, as an independent goal of, of what the movement should be seeking. Uh, yeah, and I don't think, um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, position uh, legal reform and um, I guess more revolutionary impulses as immediate mm. enemies. Um, I think it's a matter of how legal reform is used. Like legal reform can be used towards revolutionary goals. Um, mm. When uh, you're thinking about freedom of speech and freedom of association, uh, these are the primary rights that let us do things like this. It's, let's, it's what uh, lets us organize uh, queer equality groups, unions, um, and that obviously involves the legal system. Um, I think Kevin in his talk did a great job of um, identifying how um, legal reform can also shut down uh, more liberatory and revolutionary thinking in that if you think the goal of that reform is an end to itself and rather um, rather than a wedge which you can use to um, to I guess push further change and more, uh, more radical change like that's where the problem comes in. And that maybe it's has something to do with context. I mean, when you were talking about uh, the Bolshevik context um, of not only the validation of same-sex partnerships, but also, you know, multi-partner unions and things of that sort, that if you are, like, pursuing legalistic things for the sake that people have greater agency in, in determining mm -hmm. their happiness and determining how they want to live their lives, that that is most certainly a progressive um, achievement. But mm -hmm. if you are just pushing for same-sex marriage because you think that homosexuals should live under like the same conditions that heterosexuals do, even though heterosexuality is greatly restricted by um, by the family as we know it today. That that is probably still worthwhile because obviously having like, legal protection is a good thing, but um, well certainly not doesn't come from the same I guess uh, impulses that earlier revolutionary impulse that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, like the other implications of um, well, actually in your neck of the woods in the U.S. right now, I would say the debate around um, same-sex marriage in the U.S. has a very different different tone, where it's not just about the reform itself, but it's about standing up to a movement that is essentially crypto-fascist, like the Tea Party um, and Coulter. Like this group of people are absolutely batshit insane, and I do not want to live in the world that they're pushing. And anything we can do to um, put roadblocks into uh, them achieving the world they want to live in, I think, is a good thing. Like there are other implications too for these kinds. I of I mean, things. I obviously don't want to live in that world either, but um, I'm not that much of a masochist. Um, but I do wonder. Um, as someone that voted for Obama in 2008, um, <laughs> the way in which um, I think there has been a fair amount of pinkwashing in this presidential election, I mean, it's, it's historic in that um, the Democratic Party has come out, I think, much more firmly in favor of same-sex uh, marriage. But the way in which it's being appropriated, I think, is questionable, and we should like wonder um, where, I think, as Kevin pointed out, where this is going to take uh, our struggles in the future, because Clearly, like, it's great that uh, a lot of civil rights will be opened up to a whole bunch of new people, but is the LGBTQ movement and movements for sexual liberation merely civil rights? Um, I would suggest it's something far beyond that, something much more amorphous that we probably will never be able to fully 
get our grasp, grasp around, and something that does affect, you know, vanilla heterosexuals too. Um, they also are trying to determine themselves and their sex lives, uh, perhaps without the same amount of restraint or uh, obstacle or violence, but um, that our movement should seek to do a bit more than just uh, legal stuff. I often think that we end up being focused on legal questions, though, because these start to look like concrete things that can happen, <laughs> whereas the big philosophical questions just kind of, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> so, so it's, it seems important to have those as milestones mm -hmm. even while you also have to carry on a series of other conversations and I think in some sense we've all said that okay yeah. great good <laughs> let's let's keep going <laughs> mm -hmm. let's let's keep these things um, talking to each other the thing that I find troubling though is that we're talking about something like same-sex marriage in 2012 as a milestone when as you correctly pointed out in 1917 this was something that was on the agenda for um, a left in the world that we live in, a left that did not, uh, you know, stay true to that, um, to that impulse. But nonetheless, that a hundred years later, we're still talking about, you know, same-sex marriage. Like, and we're asking to be validated by Barack Obama. Like, <laughs> I mean, like he's a White Sox fan, and I'm a White Sox fan, so like I'm sure that like we have things that we could get along on, and, he, and you know, we could like have a beer and talk about baseball. But like, I don't really feel the need mm. deep down to have like what I feel intimately about myself and how I relate to other people and who I want to love validated by a democratic hack. Like, um, yeah, I mean, that, like the actual substantive reform of allowing more people to marry if they want to marry, if that's something that they, they're choosing for themselves is important. But like the sort of, you know, wanting the popular kid in school to like think you're okay is, is strange and like can potentially take our movement, I think, in a wrong direction. Mm. Yeah, and we really sort of, in, in some of the arguments that we made for... Uh, same-sex marriage, and again, which is not a, an end goal that I regret advocating for, yeah. but you know, some of the advocacy choices we made were very reaffirming the the role that the state has in telling us whether or not we are good people in healthy sexual relationships, which is sort of regrettable to me, and it was never, never really my choice as to how I talked about same-sex marriage, but certainly uh, dominated some of the, the the dialogue around it. Um, I wanted to pick up on something else that you said, and just sort of in maybe Canadian, but you mentioned the pink washing of. Yeah. But, yeah. What that made me think of is sort of the political appropriation of the goals of the movement to further, um, you know, political agendas that aren't. And I think of, for example, the Liberal Party, which presented itself in the last election in Canada as the party of same-sex marriage, and not as the party which fought to the nail to prevent same-sex marriage and took several cases through courts and eventually was forced by the Supreme Court of Canada <laughs> through the hard-fought work of activists who were advocating for the community was forced to enact a law on same-sex. Like, everyone sort of forgot that same-sex marriage was not a Liberal Party project, yeah. and they're very proud of being the government who was forced now to enact same-sex marriage. So, and then, and the well, Demo it's a classic. If well, you lose, own the winning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the, the Democrats sort of do the same thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. thank you, Barack Obama, for being the last human being who has any rational thought about same-sex marriage to come, finally come board and, and realize that the exclusion of uh, gay couples from marriage is probably a bad thing, but suddenly now, three months after that revelation, it's the crowning victory and the, the thing that we're supposed to feel proud it's about the Democratic Party. It's really interesting, too, because like I found this, I found it to be like exciting, but also like going through the party platform, it's like articulated in a really like weasley way, where like they can get through with like with not like legalizing it, they're just like for it, um, and they're not going to they're going to fight like any federal amendments to ban it. But it's very I think like unclear whether or not during you know a next term if Obama's elected, um, whether or not like there will actually be a, a push to have it recognized at the federal level. Can we try to get some yeah. questions with ones? Yeah. Um, We're just answering each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, um, you know, nor, like I'm from Toronto. Normally in Toronto, there will be someone from the Proletarian Workers' Party who will come up and denounce, you know, all of you guys are... Yes, there we go. Question. Thank you. Okay, so my question is a bit related to a few of your comments. Um, one is that you talked about the Canadian Labour Party and how they and that at the turn of the century there was all this new technology and life would never be the same ever again. 
I'm, I wonder what it's like now for us. Like we have a lot of new things going on right now, and uh, although it's great that there's all this new information and technology available, like what is really valuable, I think, in keeping this kind of issue from becoming a part of the past is some perspective. Um, so I'm curious, what kind of pieces of perspective you guys believe will keep this as a relevant subject, or will make it not do to repeat itself and be forgotten like that small one? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, like, again, just from a law reform perspective, I think the, the sexual liberation impulse is being forgotten. Um, and, like, we are not at a period of transcendency where, like, if anything, our, the, the influence of the sexual liberation uh, impulse on law reform is less and less. And it's a very sexually repressive, and I'm thinking federal criminal code <coughs> reforms, but, like, the message of recent reforms to the criminal code is that technology is scary, that sex harms children, that we need to, we, we, the Harper government changed the term, literally changed the term that you probably use, age of consent. Instead of just changing the age from 14 to 16, I actually changed the term, so now it's referred to as the age of protection. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, which to me is much more offensive than changing it from 14 to 16, because 15-year-olds yeah. are not going to pay attention to the criminal code and making sexual choices, so whatever. <laughs> but the fact that we've now changed the way that the criminal code characterizes youth choices about sexuality is not something to which young people reach the ability to consent, but something for the, from which they are protected until they reach a certain Father age. It's just, yeah, so like, to, like that's sort of, we are very much in the decline of the influence of the sexual liberation impulse on, on legal reform. So in terms of like history repeating itself, it's not, it's not the Weimar Republic part of history that's repeating itself, it's, it's the much more repressive uh, parts of history that we're seeing reflected in law reform efforts now, and that's not—it's not just to criticize this government, like the the, the or this federal government, the um, provincial governments passed a uh, what, thankfully, is being ignored, but is a, a very oppressive piece of uh, legislation that supposedly facilitates the fight against child pornography, um, but facilitates it by putting an obligation on each and every one of us as citizens to identify to the police if you have any suspicion that child pornography exists. So if you're if you see child pornography in your neighbor's home or whatever, you know you have an obligation to report that to police. It's the it's other than police state. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> other other than actual cases of child abuse, it's the only other thing that you are obligated to report to police. And of course, like not a lot of people see big piles of child pornography and don't think, hmm, that's a problem. Maybe I should report it to police. The people who do would be you know spouses in abusive situations whose husbands are you, they're encountering mm. pornography on the husband's computer, or like lawyers giving legal advice to people who are. Um, maybe at odds with the law, but like, none of us have privilege that prevents us from reporting that. So if I, if somebody comes to me and says, I need legal advice, I'm, you know, is this child pornography or not? I have to say, if you tell me about it, I have to report that to the government. So maybe, you know, just make up your own legal advice because you don't have to. <laughs> so, and, the, and the, I just, I flag that just to say that that's not Harper government initiative, that's a provincial government initiative. So it's sort, sort of universal. Um, our, the pendulum is swinging towards more sexually repressive law reform. I want to make a comment. Although my, the um, tempo and texture of mine and Karen's presentations were radically different, there is one thing that I truly agree with her on, and that's um, that the way in which we uh, I understand sexuality is incredibly limited in the present. Um, I would understand it as being the ways in which we're able to experience pleasure, the, and that our erotic lives are far beyond you know genital bumping. Um, <laughs> and I think that um, our capacity for experiencing pleasure in like a true sense of whatever that vaguely means um, is probably on the decline uh, in the present. I don't want to take an anti-technology stance because I think that technology is you know, neutral in a lot of cases and it can be used for uh, very positive things, but it can also, it can also like blanch the life out of us. Um, and it can be a very numbing, um, have a very numbing impact on society. <coughs> Um, so, yeah, I think that in order for us to kind of, you know, reboot sexual liberation struggles and for us to, like, really invest um, our time and energy worthwhile, we have to understand them as being not just about, as being, you know, that our sex lives is a huge part of it, but that also, you know, the way in which we experience art or the way in which we experience food is part of our sexual lives and something worth investing time and energy into thinking through and how they can be expanded and uh, experienced more fully. And I would say push to the capacity that capitalism can accommodate those things and then maybe, and then maybe destroy capitalism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Okay, we're going to take some more questions. Um, if I introduce a kind of libertarian viewpoint that I, that, that I typically do to the conversation and say, well, why can't, well, both in terms of morality and in terms of, of, of legal reform, why can't the legal reform movement present a radical a, a, approach? And, and I think it does by saying, well, sex and sexuality are in, in kind of going with Emma Goldman, say, that are, are and marriage is an economic thing. And, and kind of extend that into sex and sexuality or, or, or economies. And in order to engage in any in, in type of free trade situation, you have to be able to, to, to sign a contract. So sex and sexuality then become contractual arrangements if I want to have sex with, 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 with someone and partner up with them. Can I contractually engage in that? I mean, can a, you know, can two adults who are not intoxicated say, oh, we want to do this? Or, five adults or ten adults who want to go and live together and, and, and do whatever that's that's all fine and dandy. Can a fifty year old and an eight year old engage in contract? Wait a second, the eight year old is, has some sort of inability to, to engage in a you know, informed consent, informed awareness to engage in a contract with a with a fifty year old. And that fifty year old could easily be a, a, a predator and in, if they're looking to have sex with an eight year old is a predator, you know, looking to uh, looking to engage in something that that, that child's simply unable to Kind of contractually arrange and say and, and say that's okay if two 12 year olds look at each other and say or a 14 year old and a 12 year old say well let's have sex well yeah they're they're in a situation where they're both kind of on unequal footing to engage in a in a contractual arrangement and say let's have let's have, have sex with each other and as long as there's no breach of contract in that regard then you know, it's it's laissez faire. The state has absolutely no interest, or should have no mm. interest. The law should have no interest outside of that. And I mean, they start looking at at, at sex and sexuality in that context. And I know a lot of people go, oh, "Well, it makes it dull and boring." Well, from you know, from a, a legal standpoint, sure, it does make it dull and boring, and that's kind of the least likely scenario for the state to go. Well, I'm going to be involved in it, or to moralize this or that. Just say it's as simple as a contract. It's, it's trade. I'm trading. So are you saying that a legal reform approach turns so sex into a set of contractual that, relations? Yeah, that it can turn sex into a set of okay. contractual relations. And that's relations, a bad thing. Which in and of itself is a good thing. Which in okay. and of itself is, allows for very radical consequences. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Of this very specific legalistic approach. I don't think that this is necessarily what Kevin is uh, referring to. And the consent and effective consent uh, is an incredibly important way in which we mediate our relationships. But I think the overemphasis on it by the left um, is probably to our own demise because it avoids um, kind of a crucial element of sex, which is that like sex lives and romantic lives are messy and they're always going to be messy, and that we shouldn't punish people for. Um, engaging in messiness. I, I don't think that just by saying I am contracting myself to you and we have these responsibilities to one another, I think that that is in a lot of ways impossible in something that is based off of passion and free will and you know emotions that can change um, at any point in time, which is why marriage is like an interesting concept. It's a contract based off of something that you feel and that could change at any point in time. Um, so yeah, I, I understand the, the merits of thinking through a lot of these things in, in terms of consent, but I think that it does try to um, make cleaner something that has a fundamentally uh, conflicted character. We'll have time for back and forth at the pub after. So. <laughs> Can I maybe just pick yeah. up on that? Yeah, too, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure that that, like, I mean, to me, you've described what I think um, the, the model for legal regulation of sexuality that maximizes sexual liberation would look something like that. The state gets out of the way and facil facilitates people's individual agency and the choices that they make around sexual uh, sexuality um, and mostly keeps the criminal law out of it unless there's a legitimate harm that the state has an interest in. I think that's sort of the model that you're describing. That's the model that most of us think would be a good criminal code, like even if you haven't thought all that much about sexual liberation, like. I think and if people on the street would basically say, uh, it's nothing's criminal unless somebody's being hurt by it, and otherwise people can make their own choices, is probably a decent model for criminal regulation of sexuality. So again, I'm not really opposed to it. I, I, I wouldn't describe it in those contractarian kind of, because they sound cold and non-sexy to me, but that's <laughs> <laughs> but the law is cold and non-sexy, ideally, so fair enough. From, from the standpoint of political philosophy, 
um, many, many political philosophies are interested in trying to sort out a zone where the state can exit. And the family and the patriarchal family is a classic invention of one of the zones where, in some sense, it's supposed to be self-regulating and the state can exit so long as it self-regulates. And you're describing a different, more liberatory version of that, but it's very interesting that, um, um, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting the state should be more involved, but, but um, um, Plato and, and Aristotle come up with versions of the state that, that um, imagine uh, a certain private sphere that will be self-regulating that the state gets out of, unless it, it goes to hell in a handcart. So, so that that um, imagination of the structure of the state and of the ideal structure of the state uh, is has a very long history to it. And maybe we can't live without the state. Maybe we can't live without regulation. But it's it's quite interesting what we decide is the zone of non-interference. Right. But also, like when we create those zones of non-interference, it's not as though there are no other power structures that sweep in that also ought to be resisted in the struggle That's for liberation. Right. So That's right. we're not liberating solely against the power of the state, which is part of what so dom- the, power, the, the, power the movement religion, being dominated and being reformed as a law reform movement also f- allows us to forget that some of the most repressive forms of you know, the things that dictate our sex lives have nothing really to do with the state, their religion and family and, and those sorts of things as well. So so just clearing the state out of the way and clearing the criminal code out of the way is really not the whole picture of sexual liberation, but it is part of the picture that I kind of feel passionate about. Yeah, um, I co-run an erotic book club that uh, we're just starting up at our last meeting. We were discussing BDSM within the context of Macho Sluts and Fifty Shades of Grey, just kind of comparing them, seeing <laughs> where things are healthy and where things are not healthy. Um, and I'm kind of with work, our discussion did center quite a bit around consent. Um, and we ended up kind of somewhere in between the two of you, where, like in Fifty Shades of Grey, there's like that one chapter that's just seven pages of the contract that they write, and how on the surface, the idea of having a contract is kind of a good thing because at least it was kind of like, well, at least they're talking about consent-ish, except that it's not really consent because she doesn't know what she's getting into. That's going too far into Fifty Shades. Um, <laughs> but with the issue with contract in regards to a sex life is that while on the surface it's an idea of consent, like, yes, I consent to this, it ignores the fact that sex lives are very in the moment. Uh, triggers happen, just emotions happen, you've had a shitty day and all of a sudden like you want this one thing and then you change your mind and then wait you want it again and if you have a contract that you sign whether figuratively or literally you remove that need for constant communication and that need for checking in and being able to say this is what I want right now in this moment I've changed my mind I've changed my mind again back to what I originally said and having partners uh, understanding that and accepting that and, and going with that. So, yeah, it, it, the conversation kind of shifted away from from where we originally were, I think. But, yeah, the, the idea of a contract is, I think, useful in some ways, but also seems kind of limiting to me, and I feel like it, it's kind of that whole thing with Idea of sexual, sexual liberation in general, where, like you were saying, law is useful in some ways, but it's not the only picture, and it's not the only thing that we should be focusing on. And like fighting the system within the system is very useful, but also fighting the system outside of the system is also like it, it's all just a gray area. And mm-hmm. choosing one choosing one way of, of going at it is not going to fix it. Like we have to be kind of dismantling shit from all angles. At all times, mm-hmm. in order to really get anywhere. That's why it's so tiring. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say a kind of smart ass thing, but um, I, I think I think there are two um, questions operating in what you say too. Um, one is that for some people, writing the contract really is the erotic transaction, yeah. um, and and I also think that we're living in a time when we have an enormous legal erotics. I mean, just think of LA law. Think of there, there's an enormous 
um, investment in, in the expertise of the legal profession. Uh, a friend of mine once pointed out to me that the path to career success in Russia was to become an engineer. If you wanted to be a politician, you became an engineer, and there were all, you, you arranged things in the United States and increasingly in Canada. If you want to become a politician, the best route, except in Nova Scotia, where it seems to be elementary school teaching, <laughs> is, um, <laughs> is um, to be a lawyer. And, and that then that's what allows you, in some sense, to be the social engineer in that, in that space. So I think... I think part of what informs your question, and both of those books, is our historical moment, in which the contract is a site for the private play with something that most of us in public cannot control and to which we are subject both economically and, and politically. I might just respond to that. But like, I guess I would highlight again, uh, questions like, is consent real, or is consent real in this circumstance, are both legal and non-legal questions. Um, and the law struggles enough with the idea of whether consent is real, and is sometimes very good at answering that question, and sometimes bad. There are some recent cases about like whether people can, whether people's sexual consent can, that you, whether you can consent in advance to sexual activity after you fall asleep and are no longer able to withdraw your consent, which there was a Supreme Court of Canada case. There's a series of cases on whether people's consent is is uh, nullified by the HIV status of their partner, disclosed or undisclosed. So mm -hmm. the law has enough trouble struggling with the concept of dis uh, of consent. But like when you read, which I haven't done, but when you if you read Fifty Shades of Grey and question like, is that consent real and valid? There's a way of answering that question as a legal question that doesn't really get to the core. Like, is is someone being has someone achieved true liberation and acting as a true agent in providing that consent? And that has as much to do with the factors that have informed that choice and you know whether uh, that person has been presented with a whole slate of options and has grown up in a way that is free from moralization and you know whether their <laughs> yeah so and, and whether their religion is dictating a certain kind of sexual choice as being their only sort of choice none of which are legal questions and when I hear consent I sort of process it as a legal question but a lot of the more interesting questions about consent are really at a level that's much uh, deeper than just the law I think you really deep into like what I was trying to get at and I think that um, there's a, an element to which like these consensual relationships do need to be constantly reevaluated but that we also need to allow a space that sometimes people leave consensual relationships and that should be allowed um, and that like heartbreak and pain goes along with and is part of sexual liberation like that feeling of incredible pain is sort of what we're fighting for as well I would and the contract can't save you from that. No, I can't. <laughs> well, I think there's exactly no, that it will, right? That is, that is exactly can't. the point I was trying to make, right? That <laughs> yeah. it will not save you from the inevitable yeah. heartbreak yeah. if yeah. someone doesn't want to be with you yeah. anymore. Yeah. Which will happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the gentleman in the back here has been waiting patiently to ask yeah. this question. Um, first of all, as long as there's an interest in participation from the audience, can I ask the members of the panel to restrain themselves? Because, you know, for people still interested in Participating, we should get a but, uh, I'm a bad moderator. That's <laughs> basically it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, uh, in the absence of a representative from the, the workers, uh, Communist Party, or whatever, uh, may I, uh, I'd like to introduce an element of class in here. Mm -hmm. The rich have always been able to buy more sexual liberation and protection from the consequences of bad sexual decisions or even uh, you know, against state repression. Than, than the poor have. What seems to be happening now under liberalism is we're retreating from the notion of democracy, that what we wish for ourselves, we also try and arrange for others. And we have the privatization, or back reprivatization of sexual liberation. In other words, you can buy it if you're rich and the poor can't buy it. Yeah, um, just a comment on that. Like, when we create these structures of laws, um, that are to support gay rights, um, in the end, in order to actually further um, gay rights through the law, we actually have to have money to take it to court to push it further. So poor people can't afford to do that, right? Like, how does that class interaction make a huge difference? And like, is that really the way that we should be forwarding? Well, I would point to Evan's example in the Bolshevik Revolution that, that those um, accomplishments weren't 
achieved through lobbying particular legal reforms on you know behalf of rich homosexuals in the Soviet Union. They were achieved through like through social revolution, not like social revolution, <laughs> through social revolution, um, and through you know a group of individuals and a you know a mass of individuals who thought that investing in the freedom of people to make decisions about their sex lives was worthwhile. Um, that's clearly, I think, a better mode of operating in than, you know, than the Human Rights Commission or whatever being able to raise enough money to push certain things forward. Um, and it's unfortunate that a lot of kind of uh, milestones in sexual liberation, particularly in this country, have been achieved through the courts and through lobbying. I mean, abortion would be a, another example, correct? Um, so we should think through, like, what it means, I think, most certainly, that... Uh, that we've restrained ourselves or restricted ourselves to purely like judicial um, means of achieving these milestones. Yeah, and I think the um, element of class privilege needed to access legal reform, I think, is bang on. Um, uh, that's why, like I've said it a couple of times now, I think we should think about legal reform primarily as a tool, and a tool can never replace um, on-the-ground organizing. And in fact, I would argue that um, the actual process of organization is the beginning of social change. Um, it's when people really start to um, start to critique the world around them, where they start to challenge their assumptions. Um, and like that's a transformative process in general. I can think of. Um, uh, people that I know in the union movement who, before they got involved in the union movement, would probably be the jerkwads making homophobic jokes outside of a bar and now are very strong queer and trans allies. Um, I and mean, I can think of in my community organizing experience um, more so examples of, um, of people coming around on, um, on um, anti-racist principles. But I mean, just the actual act of thinking about the world around us and how we can change it and what, well, that's first step. And um, mm -hmm. a court case, uh, best case scenario, uh, you launch a legal challenge, it works. Um, and 99% of the population doesn't know about it. You organize a campaign that may or may not succeed. But, oh, yeah, sorry. I mean, sorry. Yeah. But even still, even if uh, the best case scenario happens the first time, it can then be used against and have the opposite effect uh, very quickly thereafter. Um, and just like you, the way we set up like certain things like hate crimes, it can then be like, against us in that uh, if somebody, it's not the best example, but um, this guy yeah, of a lot can then be used against us uh, and have the opposite effect that we meant to have. Um, but yes, consciousness raising can have more of an effect for sure. I might respond just to the, like, it's, it's certainly not a black and white question, and when we talk about sexual liberation as a law reform project, what that mostly is, is about getting the state out of the way, getting the law out of the way of people's sex lives, which, like, when, so for example, um, laws that facilitate bathhouse raids uh, are not primarily used to repress rich, straight white men. They're, there is a uh, class element of how those laws are enforced. Getting those repressive laws out of the way um, is, you know, to the benefit of anybody who, who engages in that sexual practice, but is, is removing a state power that is disproportionately used against people who, who you know, are on the, the lower end of the economic spectrum. So, so that, uh, that element of law reform um, kind of interacts with class in that way. Uh, there are other, uh, absolutely other elements of law reform that are much more complex about the, the power structures that they then facilitate to be used and who gets left out of that picture. Yeah, I think removing a lot of the repressive uh, laws and policies are helpful, but they're not always the Okay. Yeah, complex. Sorry, uh, the gentleman here has a question. Um, sorry, this is kind of taking us back to something that I think we started out with your guys' original mm -hmm. work. First of all, like, I actually uh, I want to thank Anthony and everyone who organized the panel. Like, it's been great. It's also been great to see like four really different perspectives and approaches to the problem. But I think the one thing that sort of ran through a lot of what's been said is sort of uh, an assumption that was pointed to, but hasn't really been fully brought out. Um, and I think you know, we hinted at it pretty firmly with some of the stuff in the and everything to Doc about it as well, which is 
Um, the problem that we've naturalized the public private divide. Um, this is like the last hour we just assume that this is uh, a natural position, when in reality it's actually product of a certain set of economic assumptions, capitalism, and the divide between productive and reproductive labor. But also it's about uh, a division of a political position now, which is an assumption about uh, liberal democratic states, sort of the various forms of liberalism. I mean, that's sort of the small L version, obviously, but um, so long as we continue to assume that the public and private are two separate spheres, all we're going to do is divide up what falls into each, right? So, and this is actually a, a huge problem if we take seriously Dr. Cope's suggestion that we have to expand what we mean by sexuality, right? Because if we say that that which is sexual should be left in the private sphere, um, something that Evan pointed out is that that means that the state has no place regulating uh, sexual violence. But that line itself can become blurred. We have to decide what does and does not constitute sexual violence. We also have to assume that the family itself is that which can't be touched by the state. And again, if we take Dr. Cope's position seriously, then it becomes really, really difficult to make problematic that which is sexual. The other sort of unsaid assumption is that there seems to be at times a discussion where we've actually separated out, or we've conflated law and politics, which are not necessarily the same thing. They're related. But that which is political often is in conflict or in contradiction with that which is legal. And uh, it's been hinted at again, but that which is legal often doesn't do you any good, right? Just because something is legal, you're legally allowed to have something in order to actually have the law on your side, there needs to be a political will behind it. Um, and that in some ways, um, the project of 1917, and I was still odd going back, like, from the old time, but uh, that was an example of uh, that which was uh, a political project, which was rather than a legal project, right? Like, Revolution of 1917 was not in any way like a legal revolution, a social and political revolution, and economic. So I wonder if um, do you guys think there's a way, uh, like whether there's any way, or, or I guess you guys could just speak a bit about that division between uh, public and private, and whether or not uh, there's a solution to this problem within a system of liberalism that continues to recognize public and private divide, as well as whether or not uh, sort of whether or not we can also encounter sort of the legal and the political under liberalism. Well, I guess um, if I believed uh, that the public-private divide could be adequately addressed under liberal capitalism, I wouldn't be a Marxist. Um, like, it's just, I kind of feel like this is the very basis of our um, society, and I do take it as an assumption, but I take it as an assumption because it's the, uh, we live in a capitalist society, and that's what we're dealing with, um, to sort of, I guess, um, push that a bit deeper under capitalism, our entire lives are split up. Um, like we have, uh, like I think Ashley did a, quite a good job of uh, discussing this, that cleave between like our working lives and our actual lives, like for 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, our time isn't our own, we belong to someone else. Um, that's a pretty, uh, on an individual experience level, I think that's a pretty fundamental component of, um, of the public-private divide. And until that is resolved, um, uh, which, uh, until that's resolved, I don't think we can really uh, see a melding of the public and private, and I don't think that can be resolved under a, a liberal capitalist state. I'll just add something very brief to that. Um, that the point I was trying to make by really emphasizing why um, capitalism, capitalism is important and uh, the state of being a worker is important is that we have very little free time and what little time we do have to our to ourselves, I want to use like scare quotes there, um, we tend to fetishize or pathologize or try to protect. And we try to um, make that like a, our, you know, our time to ourself and distance ourselves from the public or distance ourselves from the social while like failing to recognize that our, even our individual time is like shaped socially. Our opinions and uh, drives and desires about sexuality or anything else aren't formed in a vacuum, they're formed in a society in which we live. I would say that's a capitalist society in which we live, and we can't form an alternative outside of that. Um, we can forge an alternative from within it and try to like explode the thing from within, but that that's probably why I want to play with this idea of public and private and the subject and object and you know ourself and others, but I don't think that we can exist outside of it here and now. I, I want to add something to that too. Um, your comment about the public and private and our naturalization of it in this conversation is quite striking because I think in some sense we've been making the assumption that the private is the sphere that we want to protect. 
um, publicly. <laughs> um, and I thought immediately of um, a comment that Sarah Shulman made a number of years ago in New York City when homeless people had created a tent city uh, in a park and were evacuated. And her comment was, to be homeless is not to be permitted to have a private in public. And there is, there is a real class issue there, absolutely. Those who, those who may have the right to a private life are those who are well off enough to, to in some sense, afford and enshrine the evacuation of or the protect uh, curtains in a sense around around their private life, and uh, those who are unable to afford that are in essence denied <coughs> both a private life and in some sense a public right to to um, exist in some sense as the clearing out of homeless people repeatedly reminds us. So I think I think your comment is very apt, and this is one of the places that we have to put a lot of, of pressure. Yes? I just listening to all the different arguments or discussion. Uh, the word that keeps coming up in my mind is isolation. Just it just seems like isolation, uh, private versus public, individual versus the greater good. It just seems like that is the issue. Is lack of communication and isolation within our own, even our own little groups um, seems to be <coughs> it seems to be what is stopping this from, from moving forward. Okay. Yeah, and, I mean, and, and that probably is one of the negative things that comes from um, conceiving sexual, liber uh, sexual liberation as on the terms of this public private time. I don't have an intelligent, informed uh, res response to that. And so I don't have a vision of the state that doesn't somehow reflect the public private divide, but like, I can see the, the implications. And that thinking of sexual liberation as facilitating the privatization of sexuality probably prevents that kind of community around sexual liberation that you know, kind of organizing and, and the development of those other resistance strategies. So um, other than recognizing that I have very little bit to offer. Well, there is something very familiar to you. Um, the big complaint about people who are too radical or too radically queer is, you know, um, they give everybody a bad name. It would be all right if it weren't for them, right? So, so there's there's constantly a reiteration of a refusal for certain modes of expression in uh, in the public, and th th those are moralizations. Those are not legal <laughs> legal issues at all, and those are moral political designations. So there's this drawing of a line and the sending of a few people home, right? Or a lot of people home. <laughs> If they have a home, <laughs> right? So that's okay. I'm going to try not to make this even rambling or not have a point. I feel like there is a point here. I'm going to try to get to it. Um, <laughs> but I feel a certain, I don't know, maybe disconnect or like this. Like we're not quite getting at. I don't know, but anyway. And um, I don't know because we're talking about the legal, the political, and the economic, and I know that those are all social, but I feel like in a way there's kind of this social part of it, like they're really like right, right in the heat of the thing that's that's missing, and maybe it's because I haven't studied it as much. But um, one thing I notice is that often when we're talking about this, it, um, these discussions focus on people who have already identified with a certain um, sexual movement or or have already articulated kind of their their situation in a certain way and have sort of formed groups from that. But I wonder just when it comes to, in general, promoting the society in which people feel they can explore their sexuality, be free with their sexuality, um, and maybe not need to articulate it, um, I wonder what we can do to all of you, I ask, um, to make that more of a social reality. And again, I'm sure that would take all these systems into account. General, vague question. No, that's a really good one. I think that what you're talking about, which is the kind of identify, like the identitarian element, the LGBTQ movement. I mean, we even use like uh, letters to de designate, you know, all these different parts, and then the, the sum is greater than all of those parts combined. Um, is uh, that's a product of a history of. Um, identifying the sexual liberation in a particular way, fighting for this particular struggle and this particular struggle and this particular struggle. And all those things are worthwhile because these are groups that have been historically marginalized and experienced tremendous 
uh, political violence and you know personal violence. Um, but you're getting to the root of something that I was, I'm trying to make sense of too, I guess, um, which is how do we fight for every human being to come into the world and have more agency to just you know explore their sexuality and to feel like they can live without fear um, in doing that? And how do we, as a queer movement, um, avoid using kind of like vanilla heterosexuality is like the straw man or like the um, what's the the scapegoat the the thing that we can all like hate together um, how can we actually create a world in which every individual every person is born and can you know do what they want and they don't feel like they're less of a queer ally because like they're heterosexual and they might only like to have sex in a missionary position like that that's just as valid of a lifestyle as someone mm. who wants to you know frequent bathhouses or something like that. How can we fight for a world in which those were equally valid decisions of what to do with your life and that you could fluctuate between the two even if you wanted? Um, and I, I don't think that the road to uh, like how to create that sort of movement is obvious at all. I think that we have to kind of ask fundamental questions about like why we care about our sexualities to even begin to get at that. Uh, anyone else for this one? Because I think this is kind of a good potential conclusion to one last question. Yeah, actually ties in with, I was asked to bring up this point, but it also kind of ties in with the idea that sex is only taboo if we're not talking about it. And so it, it's kind of like it, it's double-handed because on one hand, one of the major ways I think of making just sex in general like very, I guess, normal, um, and just like making it something that is not taboo and so that as we're raising the next generations of kids, they, you know, they're not scared to talk about things. They, they feel comfortable asking questions. They feel comfortable um, questioning their identities and accepting when their identities change, however often they change. Um, but also the issue of normalizing things. So, like, on the one hand, we don't want things to be taboo because then people think that you can get pregnant off of, like, sitting on a toilet. This conversation happened earlier today. Um, or that, you know, that the store deli delivers babies and shit like that. Mm -hmm. um, but also normalizing things, and it's, again, ties in the 50 shades where it's like the question of, it, is it mainstream yet? Like, is it, when the, when the book about BDSM shows up in Superstore, does that make it a point where now we're okay with things as a society, or does it mean that we are going to accept or tolerate uh, certain aspects of sexuality, but not question it any further, um, and not not delve into the the gray areas and the depths that sex, any sex act, um, really does entail. Mm. So just kind of, can we just get responses sure. to both of these, and I think that'll sure. be the note that we ended um, on. I'll come back to Foucault, who argues that uh, we are incited to talk about sex and imagine that somewhere in it is the truth of our souls. Um, and he suggests that that is uh, one of the structures, the social structures that we operate within. Um, so... Introduction to the History of Sexuality, Volume 1. It's a short, skinny little book. You can add it to your reading club. Um, <laughs> um, the Compulsion to Confess, the Incitement to, to Discourse. Um, and the proposition that our sexuality is somehow absolutely at the core of who we are. Would there be other terms for that, right? And I think this comes back to your question. How do we dream up the terms of our liberation, whatever they might be, from, where, from whence comes that dream? What, what do we pull together to make that dream happen? We ask hard questions. We engage with a number of things. But we also, in some sense, have to have the space for that dreaming as well. And that presupposes a certain space of open conversation, of comfort, of, of a whole host of other things as well. Um, I guess what, uh, in response to each of those, I'd just make an observation that relates to law reform, which is sort of what I've been doing all night. It's, it's far from a complete answer. But so the, the, one of the things that I guess I took from your comment and the question was the, the primacy of identity politics and how that in and of itself is repressing because we force people to adopt an, a sexual identity that may or may not be a healthy way of thinking about themselves or you know, thinking you can only be gay or you can only be lesbian or you have to identify as bisexual or that that can't change. And to some extent, that also is uh, an offshoot of the, the rights revolution and the fact that like the, 
the dominance of the equality impulse within the movement. So in order to be an identity that we could compare to another identity, we first have to form a pretty strong and uh, insoluble identity. And that hasn't necessarily been um, a healthy development for the movement. It's gotten, it's, it's facilitated some some change, but then it also is oppressive in its own way. So that, that's sort of the thought I have in response to that. And in, in response to your comment, you know, um, again, just kind of bringing it to a law reform question, the, 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 the talking about of things is better for the liberation of, or for sexual liberation. And, and I think, to me, that's just another indication why we ought not to be comfortable with censorship as a, as a queer rights movement, like why we really ought to fight um, the impulse that the movement seems to be forming into of, of expecting the state to interfere and to oppress people's freedom of expression when they happen to be things contrary to, to how we feel as queer people. Because big picture, censorship is bad and it's bad for the cause of, of sexual liberation. So it's not really an answer to your question, but it's something that I thought of in response to the statements that you made. Evan? Um. Both of those were like really good questions that I don't think I was prepared to answer, so I still have a lot swirling um, around. Um, I, um, I like that you brought Fifty Shades of Grey in it. Um, I uh, don't think, um, I've been seeing this all over the place too and in unusual places, I don't think that um, Fifty Shades of Grey being at the uh, no frills means we've achieved sexual liberation. Is it no frills? I think so. That's very shocking. Come on, where is it not? <laughs> <laughs> to the point. <laughs> um, yeah, what's interesting about like uh, representation, and I would argue like this has been um, kind of a, what I'd identify as a secondary setback um, for uh, the queer, uh, at least the queer liberation movement, um, uh, that we um, are very, very attentive to pop culture and representations in pop culture and. You know, there is some stuff there, but in the end, art, um, use that term loosely in <laughs> reference to Fifty Shades of Grey, but um, art is always going to be um, a, set, a site of political battlegrounds, both um, in terms of what that art and society means to that society, as well as over the content of what's in that. So, um, uh, what the good thing is, it does open up those discussions in a way like. My mother is, she's a nurse, and she's um, talking to me about all of her friends at work reading Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, believe it or not, I never thought I would get into a conversation with my Presbyterian mother about BDSM. So, like, I mean, it does do some interesting <laughs> stuff. Um, on the question of identity, um, yeah, there aren't easy answers. Um, I'd like to end with a book, and um, Alexandra Kalanite said in her. Um, can't remember in which work, but um, and I'm probably going to mess up the quote, but uh, she said something to the effect of that um, satisfying satisfying one's sexual desire should be as easy as the ways we satisfy our thirst for water. And um, I think, I don't know any of the specifics about what that world will look like, but I think when we're there, um, that will, yeah, I think we'll think about in those terms how we get there is the big question. Mm. Um, I want to and by attending to the gentleman who raised the question about class um, first, and then <coughs> back to your question. Um, it's true that the rich have enjoyed greater sexual freedom even before capitalism. Um, people were you know, engaging in gay acts way before you know, there was like a gay, pers like a gay identity um, that we could speak of. Um, and it's interesting because it's only with the rise of sexuality amongst the working class that um, in many countries homosexuality is first criminalized. Um, so it's when it becomes a broad you know, broadly practiced um, element amongst working class people that it becomes begins to become stigmatized in a new and kind of peculiarly modern way. We should think through why that was um, and why the working class's sexuality is more dangerous in a lot of ways than um, the bourgeoisie's. Um, and I think that that is because the question of the working class wanting to enjoy their sexualities and being frustrated by their sexualities has opened up all the questions that I started my presentation with, you know, like the two minutes of just asking questions about our present moment. Um, and I think that we've tried to resolve a lot of those questions in a lot of different ways, some more successful <coughs> than others, some more limiting. Um, and that I would admit that, like, clearly, like, being well-educated in terms of, like, how your body works and how, you know, pregnancy works and how, you know, sexually transmitted diseases are, exist in the world, is, is information that we must have and should use, but it's not the end-all be-all. Um, and this kind of movement towards what I brought up with Adorno, with, um, towards the healthy sex life, is, um, is limited. And that, just to kind of end on another, with another Adorno quote, 
he talks about um, that sexuality under capitalism is disarmed as sex, as though it were a kind of sport, and that we should be wary of the ways in which our sexualities are redefined um, just purely by acts in which we engage and not by um, a craving and a desire that we have for something more. Okay, yeah, so that'll be it. And uh, we're going to be going to the grad house for drinks and food, presumably free food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.